Okay, thanks folks. I think we'll we'll kick off now. We might just have a couple more people coming through. Um, but yeah, just to welcome you and say good afternoon um, and welcome to uh, the virtual EGU uh, this year. Uh, obviously, it's a virtual annual meeting of uh, the European Geosciences Union. And this year, we've got an impressive 14,000 abstracts and 16,000 people from across the globe participating in the meeting. Uh, so my name is Erin Martin-Jones. I'm this year's EGU press conference assistant, and I'll be hosting today's press conference, which will include a question and answer session following the presentations by our five speakers, um, which will allow members of the media to ask your own questions. So once the last speaker has finished, please write the, last, the letter Q in the chat box to ask a question, and I'll call on you directly in the order that the questions are asked um, to, uh, to ask your question. You're also welcome to type your questions out in the chat, and I can read them out for you if you'd rather. Um, so hopefully this won't happen, but if for some reason Zoom suddenly quits, uh, we will restart the press conference and I'll give you all a few minutes to rejoin the session. So likewise, if you've got some, some home internet problems, you can rejoin the session and that's completely fine. Someone will let you back in. So the abstracts and other documents relating to the press conferences are uploaded to the documents section of the online press center. So that's uh, media.edu.eu. So you can please check in there for more information. Um, so I'll introduce all of our five panelists now to make for a faster transition in between them. Uh, and so obviously this press conference is titled Improving Food Security, New Techniques. Um, and our speakers are firstly, uh, Dr. Shrad Shukla, who is Associate Researcher, University of California at Santa Barbara, United States. Uh, next up, we have Gabriele Jimaroyes Nobre, who is research associate at the Vrije University uh, in the Netherlands. And then we have Dr. Andrew Smerald, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the Karl Reuss Institute of Technology in Germany. And then we have uh, Manon Bayard, uh, who's a researcher at the University of Oslo in Norway. And lastly, we have Cristina Madrid Lopez, uh, who's research associate at the Autonomous University of Barcelona in Spain. I don't know, Fabio, if Cristina has turned up yet. I can't see her in the list. Not yet, no. So we'll, we'll hang on um, and we'll leave Cristina to present at the end. Hopefully she will turn up, um, but if not, you can find her slides on the virtual EGU press center afterwards. And I'm sure Christine would be happy to chat to journalists after this. So we'll run in that order then, and I'll hand over to our panelists uh, who'll be speaking for roughly five minutes each. Um, and then after all of our panelists have spoken, we'll open up the floor for questions from journalists. So should we start then with, with Shrad, Dr. Shrad Shukla? Great, uh, let's do it. Thank you. Uh, I assume you can sh see my um, slide now. Yeah, we've got your slides. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for being here. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak. Um, and a good morning from uh, Ventura, California. Uh, so, this presentation is going to be about a uh, agro-pastoral water deficit forecasting system that we are developing uh, for West Africa to support uh, food insecurity early warning. Uh, and this project is supported by Servier program, which is a joint initiative of USAID and NASA. Um, in the region of West Africa, we are working very closely with our partners at AgriMed, uh, located in Nimai, Niger, uh, and SILS. So just uh, some key messages that, that uh, we're hoping to convey from this presentation. Uh, several countries in West Africa are prone to food insecurity, uh, as many of you may know already. Uh, at least in the last 10 years, uh, there are several countries in West Africa that have reached 
crisis label of food insecurity. Now, what that means is that once the label of food insecurity reaches to crisis level, then emergency food assistance is needed. And drought, of course, leads to or worsens food insecurity. And this is why uh, drought forecasting is an integral part of food insecurity. And this is what we are doing in this project. Um, our project uh, and our work is specifically shows that latest sub-seasonal climate forecasts from multiple global climate models can help improve drought forecasting and also provide uh, drought uh, forecasting information at a spatial and temporal scale that is most relevant to the decision makers in the region. And um, as I mentioned before, we are currently building a 21st century water deficit forecasting system for West Africa, uh, which will focus mainly on agricultural and pastoral usages. So another context here, and this is just a, a map that uses uh, integrated uh, phase classification, IPC, uh, which classifies uh, food insecurity into five different categories, uh, ranging from minimal food insecurity to famine condition. And what we are showing here is uh, the worst condition of food insecurity that any of the West Africa country has reported in the last 10 years. And also the frequency with which uh, different parts in West Africa have reported uh, these different uh, classes of food insecurity. So we can see that in general, there are a lot of countries which have reported crisis level at least once, which means the food assistance, emergency food assistance has been needed for those countries at least once in the last 10 years. And these are the some of the countries like Mauritania, Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger and Nigeria and Chad, where we are focusing our work on, and that is mostly because those are the countries which are typically, uh, which have typically reported food insecurity more often. So another context for this, uh, we conducted a extensive survey of uh, uh, climate service providers from national meteorological and hydrological service agencies in many of the West African countries. And we found that uh, uh, there is a general need of going beyond course scale seasonal forecast uh, to some to a sub seasonal forecast which are uh, able to provide us uh, drought information at a better spatial and temporal scale so to keep uh, keeping that in mind we are working on um, a, a water availability forecasting system for both agricultural water use and for pastoral water use and a key and a tool for developing this forecasting system is again sub seasonal scale forecasts of both rainfall and evaporative demand from multiple global climate models. So, this is just an example of how these products look like. So, on the top is a product that's uh, useful for agricultural uh, water usage. And what this map shows here is that the places where we, uh, which are in green, there is a higher likelihood of above normal. Uh, above, above normal uh, crop production and the regions that are in, shown in brown, uh, they have higher likely of below normal agriculture production. So these are the kind of the maps that we are uh, providing in the region. Um, and also in terms of uh, water level uh, forecast or pastoral usage, this is another map that comes from FuseNet water point monitor. And again, in this map, the places that are in green uh, they are indicated to have good level of water. Uh, the places that are in red, they have near uh, dry water level. So uh, just as an example, uh, we are using multiple climate models for providing sub-seasonal scale forecast. And these forecasts go out to the next 30 days and they are updated every week. So for example, this is a forecast that was provided uh, in, on the last uh, Thursday. Uh, of April 22nd. And here's just a map that shows that these forecasts are skillful, uh, especially in the critical months uh, of June to September. All the regions that are in dark red colors are the ones which have higher skill in the region. Finally, another important result that I wanted to share is that what we are finding is that there is a stronger connection between 
estimates of a monthly available moisture and uh, seasonal vegetation health in West Africa. Uh, and that the connection is stronger in those uh, regions of West Africa, uh, which are shown here in red color. Uh, they are the regions that have experienced food insecurity much more often than other places. So you can see that the correlation basically between both of those variables is stronger in the places that are in red and generally weaker in the places that are blue, which just means that places which are less food insecure, this connection between climate and vegetation is, uh, is, is weaker. So with that, I would like to uh, acknowledge all, the, uh, all of our partners from different institutes. And I would also like to welcome you to follow um, Climate Hazard Center uh, and um, my Twitter handle for more updates. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Shukla. Um, again, if, if anyone has any questions, please sort of save them for the end once we've uh, heard all of our five speakers. Uh, so next up, let's, let's move on then to Gabriella. Uh, Dr. Nobre. Uh, yeah, let thank me start you. by sharing my screen. And I hope you can see my presentation in full mode. Okay, great. Then, uh, well, again, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Gabriela Nobre, and I'm a researcher at the Dry University in Amsterdam. Um, and in the next minutes, uh, I would like to give you an overview of, uh, of the project uh, that I've been coordinating that is called the Forecast-Based Financing for Food Security. Um, and this project was conducted in partnership with the 510 initiative from the Netherlands Red Cross um, with the Climate Hazard Center uh, that uh, Shred just uh, uh, gave uh, his overview uh, at the uh, UC Santa Barbara uh, and the, Ken the Kenya Red Cross um, with also funds from the Global Facility for Disaster Risk Reduction and Recovery. Uh, the Foreign and Commonwealth and Development of Office and the Center for uh, Global Disaster Protection. Um, before I start going to the, into the project, let me give you uh, an overview of the problem that we try to approach. So as you may be aware, uh, with an, when an extreme event happens, such as floods and droughts, an increased number of humanitarian organizations uh, provide affected population with cash in order to support livelihoods facing critical levels of food insecurity. Um, the problem is that uh, these humanitarian assistance, they often reach the population too late uh, when, the basic, when their basic needs are already deteriorated. Um, however, the impact of these hazards, they can be reduced when forecast information is available to trigger anticipatory action. Therefore, uh, we believe that there is a growing opportunity for humanitarian organizations to trigger and also to implement cash transfer within the window of opportunity between the issue of a forecast and information and the materialization of the event. So our F4S project uh, worked within this window of opportunity by providing tools and evidence on how this early action could reduce uh, the risk of food insecurity. Um, in our project, we did that uh, by investigating three pillars. That's uh, what I'd like to talk to you today uh, in my presentation. The first one was forecasting. Um, the second was through a better understanding of the local context. Uh, and the third was uh, through an understanding of the benefits of acting early. Um, and I also would like to highlight that the project had Kenya, Ethiopia, and Uganda as case studies. So um, an important feature that I've just mentioned of our project was uh, the attention we gave to better understanding the local context um, and the livelihoods of the people that uh, we are trying to support um, in parallel to developing these uh, forecasting systems. Um, so for this, we carried out household surveys 
uh, to better understand uh, both the communities and also their local knowledge on early warning signs of food insecurity. And uh, we found that early action is often adopted by the communities once they have the information of an upcoming hazard. But once uh, hazards uh, hit the community and these impacts are felt, most of the households implement some sort of negative, negative coping uh, strategy. Uh, for instance, um, they reduce the number of meals. Um, we have also observed uh, in terms of um, local knowledge that there is a large variety of local knowledge that these communities have and that they also use their local knowledge for guiding their decisions. Um, also, we have uh, performed a choice experiment uh, to better understand uh, people's expenditure choices um, if they would receive cash transfer prior to a shock. So we did that in a sort of a game by playing scenarios in which some designing elements of a cash transfer program uh, were tested, uh, for instance, uh, the payment format. Um, and we observed that the expenditure choices uh, can change depending on certain designing elements. So for instance, um, here on this graphic, we see uh, that uh, there is a higher share of the aid uh, that would be spending food expenditure if these beneficiaries would receive aid in small payments instead of a lump sum. So we think that information like this uh, is important for understanding ways in, um, in which these uh, cash transfer programs could maximize an outcome. Um, as concerning forecasting, uh, we focus on developing models that can predict key uh, components of food security. Um, and uh, after we identified some, uh, uh, some food security indicators that are relevant for a certain geography, um, we came up with three uh, indicators that we could potentially forecast. Uh, the first one um, was uh, the shortage on calories, uh, in which we forecast whether a certain percentage of a population would be likely or not to experience caloric shortage. Um, also, we forecasted uh, forage scarcities, uh, which is an indicator that links well with livestock mortality in pastoral production systems. Uh, and lastly, we forecasted transitions in the state of the food security, which tell us uh, months ahead whether the levels of food security is going to deteriorate, uh, improve or remain the same. So in a nutshell, um, what we have uh, observed uh, was that um, with the aid of machine learning, but also in combination with local knowledge and relevant biophysical and socioeconomical information, uh, we were able to forecast up to three months ahead of a short shortage on calories for all the agricultural and agro-pastoral regions in the maps. Um, we were also able to forecast up to four months ahead forage scarcity for pastoralist uh, districts in Kenya. Um, and also we were able to forecast up to one year ahead uh, transitions in the state of the food security in Ethiopia. So overall, what we, we, what we think that's uh, interesting about these is that providing these accurate uh, forecasts on key indicators of food security long ahead opens up a wide window of opportunity. Um, the last pillar I uh, investigated uh, in our project was the benefits of acting early based on forecasts rather than uh, ex post when it's often too late. Um, and we did that by carrying out uh, cost benefit analysis. Um, and uh, what we have found with the cost benefit analysis um, is that uh, there's a larger range of benefits that can be generated if the financial support reaches the communities uh, earlier. So uh, for instance, in pastoral communities in Kenya, we found that uh, each Kenyan, sh uh, Kenyan shilling invested in early action yields 3.6 in benefits. Um, and this is due uh, to the fact that um, early payments allow communities to use the money to protect their livestock instead of replacing them. 
Um, and in addition, uh, we have also found that acting earlier can also be cheaper. So here in blue, um, we show all areas in which a higher reduction in cost per beneficiary can be achieved if this cash transfer is disbursed prior to a shock instead of after. So uh, some key message of our project. Uh, overall, we learned that uh, weather-related hazards often lead communities to implement negative coping strategies. Um, however, forecast information is often trust trusted by the communities. Um, and we also found that including uh, local knowledge, we can also produce accurate forecasts of key indicators of food security uh, long ahead of a shock. So this combination of trust and lead time opens up a wider window of opportunity for implementing anticipatory action at the short and also um, uh, medium term, which can also avert some of these uh, negative coping capacities. Um, we, we have also found that the design of X and the cash can uh, have an effect on people's expenditure and therefore is important to further investigate these uh, co-designing strategies between institutions and beneficiaries. Um, and lastly, we have also found that despite saving lives and creating a, a, a wider range of benefits, early, um, early cash can also be a cost-effective solution. Um, thanks very much for listening to my talk and uh, open the floor for any questions, if any. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nobre, for that introduction. Um, so we'll save questions till, till the end um, and press on. Uh, so next on the list is uh, Dr. Andrew Smerald. If Andrew could come forward. Thank you. Okay, I'm muted, sorry. Great, we've okay, got you Okay, so, thank you. Hi, so we've been looking at the cost of producing more food. So in particular, what's, um, what kind of byproducts are produced in particular in terms of nitrogen? So just as a taster here, the map is showing the cost of producing a bit more maize and the cost in terms of greenhouse gas emissions where red means high and green means low. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, I'm oh, sorry, my slides are not moving on. If you click on the screen, it should work again. Uh, sorry, apologies. So the background to this is that there's quite an industry in predicting what future food needs will be. So this depends a lot on the assumptions about diets and about food wastage and population growth and so on. But the consensus is that we will need more food in the next decades and supposedly maybe 25 up to 70 percent more by 2050. So how do you produce more, more food? Well, there's two obvious uh, solutions to this. Either you, you have more cropland, you expand it, or you work the cropland more intensively that you do have. And so there's a consensus that the intensification is likely the better way to go because it seems to produce less biodiversity loss, fewer greenhouse gas emissions, and also just there's only so much good farmland uh, left available. So this brings us on something called yield gaps. So what is a yield gap? The yield gap is quite a simple concept. It's just the difference between what's actually being produced in a region and what could potentially be produced with current uh, technology. So if you want to intensify, then you need to close these yield gaps. There's many different strategies, of course, to do this. You can mechanize more, you can employ more human labor, many other ways. But the one thing that's common to all of these strategies is that you need more, you need sufficient nutrients for the plant to grow. And the main nutrient is nitrogen, and this comes as fertilizer or manure or, or something else. So the problem with adding extra nitrogen to get more plant growth is that it comes with some harmful environmental consequences. One of these is nitrous oxide emissions, so it's a gas. It's uh, produced by microbes in the soil and is responsible for roughly 7% of global warming. And if you look at the, the graph on the right here, you see this hockey stick-like figure over the last 2000 years, so similar to carbon dioxide. 
nitrous oxide concentration in the atmosphere has turned up sharply in the last 100 years or so. And the main source of this is fertilizer, or the main anthropogenic source, at least. The second problem coming from all this extra nitrogen is nitrate leaching into groundwater. So nitrate is necessary for plants. It's one of the ways they take up nitrogen. But once it leaches out of the root zone into the, into the groundwater, it's both a pollutant. So for example, in Germany, there's strict laws on how much is allowed to be in tap water. And it also causes what's known as eutrophication, where algae grows and dies and consumes all the oxygen. And then you get big dead zones. So for example, here in the, the Gulf of Mexico. So what have we been looking at? So the question we really asked is, if you start to close these yield gaps, how much of these extra harmful things will you produce? Or if I say this in a slightly more optimistic way, where can additional food be produced at the lowest uh, cost? The way we've been looking at this is we have a computer model which tracks nitrogen and carbon and water and plant growth and so on, all on an hourly basis. We run this on a global scale. And as you can imagine, this requires quite a lot of computer resources. So a couple of results. So I show you something for maize. So maize is one of the main global crops. So maize, rice, and uh, wheat produce a lot of global calories. So the first plot here shows the, how big these yield gaps are. So basically red means that the yield gap is very small. So there's not a huge amount of potential to uh, close it. Whereas green means a very big yield gap. So plenty of room to uh, produce more food. So this in itself is not a particularly new result. This other people have looked at as well, but um, of course it's nice to know that our model is consistent with what others have found. What we then add to this is say, well, if you do produce a bit more maize, how much of these greenhouse gases will be produced? Where again, red here means high and green, green means low. And one thing you can notice is the places which uh, already have high yields or low yield gaps also would produce a lot of greenhouse gases um, if, they, if the yields were increased. So for example, in Western Europe or China or North America. And this is showing you that this greenhouse gas emission is nonlinear. So the first unit of fertilizer you add is um, most of it ends up in the plant. By the time you get to the hundredth unit of fertilizer, a lot of it is being converted into, into other things. We can do the same thing for, for nitrate leaching. The pattern is, is not so different. One thing you might notice here is in India, producing more maize seems to cause quite a lot more nitrate leaching, particularly in East India. And one, I mean, one thing this is highlighting is that soil and climate are, are very important for this as well. It's not just uh, how big the yield gap is. So how expensive is it to increase food production? So one thing we looked at is, well, let's imagine that we, we start closing these yield gaps and we, we do it such that uh, food production increases by 25%. So at the lower level of the, uh, what's expected to be needed by 2050. And let's imagine we just do this in the, the optimum way. So the, the way which produces the least of these uh, uh, nitrogen byproducts. So if we do that, we find maybe 20% more of this greenhouse gas nitrous oxide, 25% more nitrate being produced at the same time. The good news then is that, well, it is possible to produce more food without increasing the amount of uh, nitrogen losses per unit of food. So this is not completely obvious, given that I claim this was a nonlinear type effect. The bad news, of course, is there's, there's no free lunch here. More food means more greenhouse gases, uh, more pollution at a time when really we'd be like to be reducing these types of things. So then what is the implication you can take away from this? I think, well, closing yield gaps is clearly important, particularly because they're generally biggest in the places that are most in need of, uh, of some extra food over the next years. But if you actually want to make a dent in greenhouse gas emissions, uh, it has to be combined with also fertilizer reductions in richer regions. So, okay, this is basically what I'm gonna say. So thanks for listening. Thank you, Dr. Smerald. Um, so let's head on now to uh, Dr. Manon Bayad. If you can now come forward and share your slides. Yes. Thank you, Manon. Excellent, we can see them. 
Um, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Manon Bajar. I'm a researcher at the University of Oslo. Uh, this week at EGU, we are presenting a study entitled Climate Viability Control the Development of the Pre-Viking Society during the late antiquity in southeastern Norway. This study is part of a project called Vikings. It's a pluridisciplinary project involving a geologist, biologist, archaeologist to better understand the role of uh, volcanic eruption on climate and society. And this afternoon, uh, our main question is how did past societies respond to climate change? Because we need to adapt our agricultural system to present and future uh, climate change, to maintain and improve the food security and take part in the climate action. So how we do that? Uh, a way to do this is uh, to uh, learn from the past, to study past cases. Um, so hundreds to thousand years ago, uh, look at the climate viability, the, how uh, the soci society at that time responded, if they responded or if they collapsed and, or if they adapt and how they adapt. Uh, we found here first illustration of early adaptation of societies uh, in the pre-Viking age to climate changes. And we also provide new insights into this society between 3 and 800 AD, called uh, a period called the Dark Ages, because we don't know so much about the society of these periods. That is between what we know very well about the Roman, the Antiquity, and the Viking and the Middle Ages. Uh, to learn from the past, we are uh, actually studying uh, lake sediment cores. Those are natural archives of the environment. It is very similar to ice cores, but this here it's not ice. This is the mud that is accumulating year after year in the bottom of lakes. So we have some layers to reconstruct year after year in the evolution of the environment. So it's a continuous record of the environment. It contains particles of soils through erosion and runoff. And it contains so pieces of plants, it contains pollen from the vegetation, and also DNA of plants and animals. And it also includes the information about the biological life of the lake uh, that is uh, dependent, for example, on the temperature. So we also have here a record of the climate in this sediment course. So at the same time, in the same archive that we can date with C14. Uh, we have a record of climate, vegetation, and human activities. Here we are studying uh, Lake Yokocha, a lake that is close to the airport of Oslo uh, in Norway. And we reconstructed the temperature with the chemistry of calcium on the period between 200 and 1380. And we have uh, one period at the end of the Roman period, and also one period. Uh, in the Viking Age and in the Middle Age. So here you can see that the Viking Age started with an increase in the temperature. And between these two warm periods, we have a colder period, uh, referred as the Dark Ages cold period. So it was much colder during this period. And then we reconstructed the agricultural practices by counting uh, first the pollen of uh, cereals that we find in the sediment. So for example, here we have pollen of rye, wheat, and barley. And I highlighted in the orange period we, are, we have more of this pollen of cereals, meaning that we had more cultivation of cereals during these periods. And finally, we reconstructed husbandry activities by measuring the concentration of sodaya, that is a fungi that is uh, developing on the feces of uh, animals. So if there were uh, animals grazing around the lake, uh, then the feces will be washed to the lake with uh, the rain, and then we can find this uh, fungi in the sediment. And I highlighted in green uh, periods where we have uh, obviously grazing activity. And what you can see here is that there is an alternation between a period with more cultivation of cereals and period with more grazing activity between 200 and 880. And if we compare that to the climate reconstruction on top, we can see that when it was warmer, 
we had a cultivation of cereals. And when it, when it was colder, we have more uh, grazing activity. Here, it's a little bit warmer. We have more uh, cultivation of cereals. Colder, more grazing activity. Warmer, more uh, cultivation of cereals. Uh, less grazing activity, and so on, until the Viking Age. So we showed that we have a dominance of cultivation of cereals, but also hemp during warm periods, and on the contrary, dominance of grazing activities during cold periods, suggesting that already 1,500 years ago, the society uh, before the Viking Age was uh, able to adapt their agricultural practices to climate. If you want to know more about our project, you can use this uh, QR code or follow me on Twitter to know more about our activities this week at uh, EGU. Thank you for your attention. Lovely. Thank you, Manon. OK, and, and last but not least, let's head over to Dr. Dr. Cristina Madrid-Lopez, if Dr. Lopez is around. Yes, I'm here. Excellent. Uh, so you're able to, to share your slides, okay? I think so. Let me see. Good. Yeah, we've got them. Okay, super. Perfect. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here today and thanks for the, for the invitation. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit of the work that we develop uh, at the uh, Universitat Autónoma de Barcelona and the Sostenible Research Group, where we examine um, how sustainable can uh, urban agriculture be. Um, so um, we depart from this, uh, from the issue of developing urban agriculture in a world in which uh, the urban food demand raises in between 50 to say, or is expected to raise in between 50 and 60 percent and where long food chains have uh, environmental issues and then when there is this tendency uh, in urban areas to develop agriculture because it provides uh, not only food but also some other environmental and social services uh, and at the same time we have agriculture being the main water user and uh, being a resource that is under high competition with other uses in urban areas. And um, most recently, the, um, the um, European uh, Water Framework Directive has been analyzed and has been detected that um, the coordination with uh, urban development, it's a little bit weak. Um, and so the aim it has about improving uh, or reducing vulnerability of water bodies, especially important in urban areas. So, uh, in order to do uh, our uh, so, in order to try to answer this question and to uh, to have in mind these issues, we analyzed um, a region in in Barcelona, which is a metropolitan region, Barcelona, in which we have about three million inhabitants, but we we welcome about in between uh, four and five million every day for work. Um, and, and nowadays we cover 10% of the food needs of the fruit and vegetable needs um, in the local area. Um, and we find ourselves at the moment developing a new urban, uh, a new urban developing uh, development plan. And um, so we, um, we do this study within the uh, European uh, project URBAC, which is led by Professor Gary Alba. And I leave you here uh, a picture of my colleagues, Joan and Sergi, with whom I'm also working in this research line. Um, so in this project, uh, we uh, combine or we integrate climate and hydrological models with models of land use to assess how green infrastructure in general and also agriculture um, can change the local climate and how the changes in the local climate can influence uh, urban agriculture. So uh, what is new in this particular study that I would like to uh, introduce today is that we are doing a georeference geograph analysis that uh, is usually uh, not uh, the case in, in here. It has a monthly resolution and it also connects the vulnerability of river basins with the uh, locations where the water is being used. 
Um, so just for not being very deep into the into the details, um, feel free to email me if you need more information. But what we do is we map the agriculture and the related uh, water extraction points. And then uh, we associate those extraction points with the river basins or the aquifers. And then um, with the we, we, uh, we use that geographical uh, uh, connection to assess the changes in the vulnerability status of the river basins or the, uh, or the, or the aquifers. Um, and just a couple of uh, highlights, um, the type of results that we, we are receiving. This is, for example, a comparison between four scenarios where um, S0 is the current scenario where agriculture is 8% of the surface of the metropolitan region. And then one scenario that would be reducing agriculture if the current urbanization trend continues. Then we also have uh, two, two, two scenarios. One of them would be to revert that trend and the other one would be um, to, uh, to um, use the full potential for agricultural production in, in the land of the metropolitan region. So do you see that, for example, this graph is showing water use um, by month. So the, the, the water use uh, peaks or starts to peak in April. And that is not only uh, because of the weather changes, but also because of the type of crops and the, and the crop calendar that we have in the region. And you see how, for example, the, because of the type of crops produced in the, in the different scenario, even though we are reducing the area, we are increase, slightly increasing uh, water use. So um, taking into account the type of crop and time actually matters. Um, if we if we uh, assess what this what does this mean for the local water resources, uh, we will go from a situation in the in the, the current situation right now is that we have um, most of our river basins in a very bad status, uh, with the rest not being that that well all along. So we do see that they are all uh, in in indexes for three, four, and five, which has, which are the worst ones. Um, and this is for uh, the agriculture uh, uh, that we have right now, that is 8% of the territory. But when we go to up to 20% of the territory, for example, that means that um, potentially um, all our, if we do not consider uh, to regulate the type of crops that we are growing, for example, and the time when we are growing them, then we will reach a situation which is actually against the principles of the Water Framework Directive. Um, so that is to say um, the, the take home messages that we have for the moment, because the, the study is an, is an ongoing effort, are um, that urban development needs to consider the crop calendar um, and maybe create a list of allowed crops, for example, for urban agriculture, in the same way that you have a list of requisites for the buildings and the type of buildings that you can, uh, that you can put. Um, and then um, that we have already tools to, to constrain um, the requirements of urban development in terms of uh, considering agriculture and, for example, the Water Framework Directive vulnerability indexes uh, could be one of those of those tools, and um, this is um, the little bit that I wanted to to show you. Um, this is our session, which is next Wednesday. If you're around and you want to join, you're very welcome. And here you have some details on how to join the network of the Urbac. It's a project that is going to be running until 2024. And here you have my email if you have any more questions. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Um, and yeah, thank you to all of our, our speakers and their fantastic presentations there. Um, so now I'm going to open up the floor for questions. And um, as before, if you have questions, feel free to either type a Q in the chat box and um, we'll head over to you and you can read out your question. Or I can also uh, read out any questions that you might have as well, if you'd rather type them in.
Okay, so uh, James has has a question for Manon. So James, if you'd like to um, unmute yourself. Yeah, can you hear me? Got you, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Manon. Thanks for the talk. Um, yeah, it's just, um, it'd be good to hear a bit maybe about the process um, by which you extract these cores from the lake. And also, I know with um, ice cores, that there's an issue sometimes where when a glacier starts to melt, you get mixing between the different layers. So, you know, if you're talking about a lake sediment, is that is that a challenge to, to, to try and unravel the mixing that might have taken place between the different layers? Um, so for the lake sediments, so the sedimentation, so the deposit of the mud started when the lake uh, started to form, actually, when the lake started to be a lake. And this happened in Norway, Scandinavia, uh, after the melting of the glacier, so 10,000 years ago. So after that, we don't have the glacier uh, anymore here. Um, in Norway, and then we have a continuous record without any uh, glacier advance that can uh, disturb the sediment here. Okay, thank you, Manon. Okay, so uh, we have a question from Sarah, Sarah Derwin, uh, and Sarah says, wonderful talks, uh, and a question for Dr. Nogre. I'm wondering if you can go into more details about the monetary support for communities. It looks like a great return on investment. What is the money usually used for? Are, are these temporary stop gaps like for one season or more long-term solutions? Thanks for the question, yeah. Um, so let me, um, let me see if I understood what, what were your questions. So the question is about how usually is the money spent, um, either by the, the donor or perhaps also by the community? Um, in terms of the donor, I think that this, um, this idea of uh, forecast-based action in which you can support the community months ahead of a shock is relatively new. It's, um, well, um, uh, let's say the steering of the community started by around 2015 in um, really recognizing that uh, this forecasting information is useful and can be used for uh, better planning of uh, these anticipatory action activities. And uh, well, if you look at the records of uh, donors spent, most of this uh, money is usually spent at the recovery phase. So when the communities are already heated by a hazard, being that a flood or a drought, this money is usually spent for recovery activities. And what we're trying to advocate with well, forecast-based action and also with our project in general is that there is this window of opportunity for shifting some of this money. Uh, we understand that, uh, well, the impacts um, we can reduce all the impacts with uh, the, this type of anticipatory action, but we can reduce some of them, uh, and some of them they can be um, given to the communities early in advance. So for the communities to implement type of activities that I could name, for instance, um, um, if the money reached the community months ahead of um, a potential um, um, delayed start of the season, uh, the communities can. Uh, perhaps uh, use the aid to uh, have access to more drought tolerant inputs uh, for their agricultural practice. So in fact, these communities, they can uh, try to better prepare the agricultural systems to accommodate some of the shocks. Um, if these shocks that are, they already happen, let's say within uh, the growing cycle and the communities have they already planted, what these mean, these uh, aid could do, for instance, is to reach the population early in advance so that the population can reach the market at more affordable levels, because usually what is observed once um, they already experience in this, uh, this duration on their basic needs is that uh, there is a very, it's very difficult for the community to have access to the market because the prices are already so increased uh, that uh, on top of not, not having a uh, good agricultural year, which often sustain uh, the uh, um, 
assets and uh, the um, built these uh, economical buffers. Um, these communities, they often have these assets deteriorated as well. And on top of that, the, um, uh, 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 this, this experience with uh, the fragility on the market where the prices are usually higher. So uh, these people can, uh, well, the, the communities of beneficiaries, they can use uh, this aid in order to try to reduce some of this buffer and uh, reduce some of these impacts. So it, this is, uh, for instance, some of the, the examples that we have learned from uh, interviewing the community and trying to understand how would they utilize this aid uh, if they would receive this um, aid and the support earlier, uh, early in advance. Thank you, Gabriella. So we have a question come in for Andrew. Um, the, uh, the nitrogen dioxide over the last 2000 years, out of the modern period, does it reflect old historical uh, agriculture emissions or is it a real natural background? Uh, yeah, so there's lots of sources of nitrous oxide emissions. So from uh, wetlands, from, I mean, from, from uh, natural lands, from forests, from wetlands, from, from things like this. The thing is, over the last 2000 years, it's been relatively balanced. There's sources and there's sinks. So the stuff coming from your swamps or whatever is being balanced out by nitrous oxide that is then being taken out of the atmosphere by um, reactions with ozone or something. So this is where you have a constant level. What's changed over the last one to 200 years is an intensification of agriculture and particularly the, the Harbour Bosch process, the process by which you make fertilizer. So this has basically put a lot more nitrogen into the system. And this is mostly put into agricultural fields, of course. And it's this additional nitrogen in the system, which then gets, um, which has then changed the balance between the sources and the sinks. So the sources are now uh, stronger than the sinks, let's say. So there's an increase in the, the atmospheric concentration. And if the source stays constant, then of course this will rebalance out at some higher level. But at the moment, the, the sources have been constantly increased as more fertilizer gets used. If that's uh, answers yeah. your question. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Uh, any more questions to round up? Okay, yeah, one for Dr. Shukla. Uh, what sort of information do you need to make sub-seasonal forecasts and how do you use this information to inform groups and communities like those Dr. Nogre works with? Great, uh, thank you very much for, for your question. So um, there are many uh, different approaches that can be used for sub-seasonal scale forecasting. Uh, the approach that we are using uh, uses many different uh, global climate models. Uh, and I think in scientific language, we call those a dynamical uh, climate forecast. So what, what we basically do is take these five or six different models and each of those models, they provide different numbers of scenarios of what climate may look like over the next 30 days. Uh, so for example, with these five, six models, we can get up to 60 different scenarios of what next 30 days would look like. So what we are doing now is uh, using those climate forecasts to then drive models that can provide us estimates of uh, available water for crop usage or available water for pastoral usage. So basically trying to translate these climate forecasts into something that is more meaningful to the uh, decision makers and also the uh, you know, final end users like farmers and uh, the pastoralists. Um, one thing that I didn't get to highlight in, in the presentation before is that we are working very closely with our partners uh, in, in the region of West Africa, AgriMet mainly. Uh, and also we are doing several rounds of capacity building activities with national meteorological and hydrological services in several countries. So what the, our approach to making sure that this information is actually making it to the uh, final end user, which are agri, which are farmers and pastoralists. Okay, Dr. Shukla, we seem to have lost you. Can you hear us? 
if not, we might have to come back to you, um, if that's okay. And we will head to a question for Gabriella. Can you say a bit more about the machine learning aspects of your forecasting tools? Sure, yeah, it's a, would, it's a pity that the shred just dropped because it would be a great compliment to the, to the question, actually. Um, so as Shred was uh, mentioning, there's a... Sorry, Shred, I, we sorry, lost I got you. Disconnected. Yeah, um, I don't know if we want to maybe oh, give the floor for Shred to uh, finish his yeah. question. Yeah, okay. do you want to go back, Shred? Yeah. And then we'll jump to you. Oh, sorry, so, sorry about that. Uh, no, I would just think that the one final point Oh no, you've broken up again, Shred. Oh, how about now? Huh. You're okay right I, now. Yeah. <laughs> usually it doesn't happen. Uh, well, how, how I can chat and uh, just go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're really breaking up. So yeah, we've been really lucky with, with connection so far. Do you want to put something in the chat, Shrad, just to round up if you want to? Yeah? Sure, yes, if yes. If you're able I'll to. I'll do that, okay. Sounds good, uh, thank you. And we'll just head over to Gabriella's related point, um, which will probably be our last point before okay. we wrap up. Thanks. Yeah, sure. So uh, uh, Shred was mentioning the, the dynamic type of forecast, which comes from these, um, um, well, uh, global models with different re realizations of the climate. Actually, our approach by using machine learning is taking more of a statistical based approach. So you can think of uh, machine learning as just a type of a forecasting tool, um, as you would use, for instance, with um, simple linear regressions. But in our case, we have used, uh, tried to explore the use of machine learning. So what we feed this machine learning with, it's a combination of uh, many data sets. So, uh, um, so we have uh, some core data sets that we try to extract uh, information. For instance, we can uh, play around with precipitation, precipitation accumulated with a soil moisture, with uh, uh, greenness measured by satellite, but also with uh, more infrastructure type of indicators, such as uh, the distance to the markets that people have, or uh, information from the previous seasons. And then we can see as a, this a machine learning as some kind of bucket where we feed our models. And uh, this machine learning, we do have the flexibility to train the model in order to maximize a outcome. So we can train until we find um, a range of combination of parameters which we can tune this decision, this, uh, this machine learning to a outcome that we desire. So uh, in our project, we have um, obtained at the end three different uh, machine learnings because we were targeting three different indicators of food insecurity. So uh, the difference uh, as Shred was uh, discussing from his approach and to our approach is because his approach he used, let's say, a more dynamical type of forecasting and our model is it's more um, statistical based uh, types of forecast. But that at the end, they uh, all try to capture this uh, information on looking ahead uh, for shock in the future. So thank you, uh, Gabriella. So I'm afraid we're gonna to have to wrap it up shortly as I'm heading over to the next uh, press conference, but Shrad has just dropped a comment in the chat. Um, and I don't know if you have time uh, to quickly read it through, but you can also um, follow him on Twitter. Um, Shrad's contact details are there. And likewise for all of our uh, speakers today, please, please feel free to, to drop them an email. Um, I'm sure they'd be more than welcome, more than happy to answer your questions. So thank you again for your for the speakers, for their time and for all of your questions. Um, and in the meantime, if you'd like to head over to the next prof, uh, press conference, which is called uh, Scientific Sleuthing, very exciting title that will begin um, right now, I think, <laughs> presently. So I'll hop over there. Um, and any more information that you should need, please have a look at the media.edu.eu website. So thank you. Thank you, uh, everyone. For all coming. Thank you very Bye. much.